Orthodox Journey. A missionary activity of the Greek Orthodox Christian Society working under the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of Australia presents The Neo Martyrs, a podcast series exploring the lives, times, and virtues of those saints who witnessed for Christ under Ottoman rule. This is The Neo Martyrs. One of the many things that make the Neomartyrs so inspiring is the diverse circumstances and pathways that led to their martyrdom. Their love for God transcended social status, location, customs, and societal expectations. However, when examining the Neomartyrs, there is a certain life-changing occurrence that can be found in many of their stories. This occurrence is highlighted beautifully in the life of St. Gerasimus of Carpenisi. Originally named George, St. Gerasimus was born in the village of Megalo Chorio, near Carpenisi in central Greece. He stayed there until the age of 11, when he left to work in Constantinople as a grocer with his brother. Not soon after, George's brother returned to the village, leaving the saint in the care of a relative who also owned a shop. One day, while carrying out his work, George dropped a tray of dishes, causing them to shatter. Afraid of the repercussions from the shop owner, he began to walk back to the shop with tears in his eyes. However, before he arrived at the shop, a Muslim woman saw him crying and went out to comfort him, inviting him inside. In the house, George encountered the woman's husband, who was in the process of preparing his two sons for circumcision. The man suggested to George that he should consider converting to Islam, and if he did, both he and his wife would adopt George as their son. Thankful for their kindness and assistance that they had shown him, George agreed to convert. He remained in their house for two years until the husband gave George to a Muslim bureaucrat. It was during this time where George felt great grief inside of him for abandoning his faith. Unable to reconcile the remorse he felt with the life he was living, George fled from Constantinople and returned home to Carpenisi. Here he remained for three years, going to church regularly and embracing the faith that he had thrown away. It was in the village where George met Father Gerasimus, an Athenite monk, who was about to start his journey back to the holy mountain. Yearning to truly repent for his actions, George asked the monk if he could travel with him to Mount Athos. The monk agreed and the two set off together. It was at Mount Athos where George found his spiritual father in Elder Kirillos in the Skiti of St. Bandeleimon. The elder instructed his new spiritual child how to live a monastic lifestyle and in matters of spiritual discipline. While he was a novice at St. Pandelemon, George read the lives of the new martyrs, which had been collected by St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite. This newfound direction ignited within George a zeal for asceticism, and after a year he approached his elder, asking to be tonsured a monk. Initially, the elder refused, stating it was still too early in his time as a novice. However, upon seeing the tears that George cried every day for three months after the refusal, the elder reconsidered. George was tonsured and given the name Gerasimus. Despite becoming a monk, the young saint felt so strongly about pursuing Christ that three days after he was tonsured, Gerasimus asked his elder for permission 
to go and martyr for his faith. Once again, his elder refused, and in obedience, Gerasimus stayed on the mountain. For the next three years, Gerasimus dedicated his life to deepening his relationship with Christ. So great was his love for our Lord, that after those three years, with his spiritual father's blessing, Gerasimus left the holy mountain with a renewed zeal to right the wrongs he committed by apostatizing through witnessing for Christ. Saint Gerasimus returned to Constantinople and met his adopted Muslim father, who upon seeing Gerasimus's steadfast faith, conceded that he would never be able to change the young man's mind, but rather urged to pretend to be a Muslim while in the city, so as not to be in danger. The saint responded, saying, I thank you for granting me life and for your permission to live as an Orthodox Christian. But what you have said to me, to say that I am a Muslim until I leave the city, is impossible. On the contrary, I shall become a town crier and proclaim my faith in Jesus Christ. The Muslim man then took Saint Gerasimus to his own teacher in an effort to sway the saint, but it was to no avail. He was then taken to the judge who ordered Saint Gerasimus to be beaten and thrown into jail. Time after time, the saint refused to deny his faith, but rather stood resolute in his proclamations that Jesus is the Christ and continued to glorify God. Finally, after days of both flattery and tortures, Saint Gerasimus was sentenced to death. After being brought to the place where he would be beheaded, the saint purposefully knelt facing the east. In his final act of repentance, and in a beautiful imitation of the thief on the cross, Saint Gerasimus cried out, Remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. In the life of Saint Gerasimus of Carpenisi, we can see the fundamental role Mount Athos played in his journey in becoming a neomartyr. He had renounced his faith, lived a life away from the church, and despite all this, ended up making the ultimate sacrifice for Christ. The dramatic change in the saint's life was heavily influenced by the holy mountain. It was on Mount Athos where Saint Gerasimus truly repented. It was on Mount Athos where he struggled to know Christ. It was on Mount Athos where he was called to be a martyr. The story of Saint Gerasimus is not unique in this sense. Many more neo-martyrs, such as Saint Euphemius of Dimitsana, Saint Cyril of Thessaloniki, Saint Agathangelos, would find Mount Athos to be the turning point in their lives, the place where their journeys became redirected towards Christ and the crown of martyrdom. Unfortunately, we tend to overlook the role of Mount Athos during the era of the Neo-Martyrs. However, as we can see from the life of Saint Gerasimus of Carpenisi and many other saints, the Holy Mountain acted as a lighthouse during a storm, guiding travellers towards the ultimate harbour, the Kingdom of Heaven. It was on Mount Athos where many would be renewed in their zeal and heed the words of Christ, Take up your cross and follow me. For Mount Athos and monasteries in general to play such pivotal roles in the repentance of the neo-martyrs, it took holy and God-fearing spiritual fathers to direct their new spiritual children. These included abbots of monasteries and hierarchs who were in exile on the holy mountain. One of these elders was Saint Akakios the New of Kavsokalivia, who was a spiritual father to three neo-martyrs, Saint Romanos the Pilgrim, Saint Bachomios of Usaki, and Saint Nicodemus the Albanian. Saint Nicodemus the Hagiarite and Saint Macarius of Corinth were eyewitnesses to the repentance of many of these new martyrs who arrived on Mount Athos, seeking out the exiled patriarch Gregory V, who resided at Iviron Monastery during his periods of exile from Constantinople. They sought forgiveness and hope on the holy mountain. The patriarch received them, heard their confessions, comforted them, and then would send them to Saint Nicodemus the Hagiorite, who was at that time leading an ascetic life at Kapsala. 
they were sent to him for systematic catechesis so that he could strengthen them in their faith. Many of them sought the blessing to martyr for Christ and underwent strict ascetic training in preparation for this. In the introduction to the new Martyrologion, St. Nicodemus's collation of the lives of the Neomartyrs, St. Nicodemus writes, It is right to thank God that under the heavy yoke of Turkish occupation, there were so many athletes who strove to preserve the freedom and dignity of their Christian faith. They disregarded the wealth and the pleasures of life, and they willingly surrendered themselves to martyrdom and death. Truly, this is a miracle. It is like beholding the blossoming of flowers in the middle of the winter cold, or sunlight in the dead of night, or freedom breaking the chains of imprisonment. However, the monasteries on Mount Athos did not just serve as a place for the neo-martyrs to develop spiritually. They also served as an oasis for the Orthodox faith amidst the spiritual and educational barrenness of the Ottoman Empire. It was on Mount Athos that St. Cyril Lacaris, Patriarch of Constantinople, himself a neo-martyr, decided to found an academy of higher learning. It was this Athenite academy that gave rise to other institutions throughout the Ottoman Empire, such as the Great School of the Nation in Constantinople and the Evangeliki Scholi in Smyrna, which led to the education of monks, clergy and hierarchs who were well versed in both the Orthodox traditions and the higher learning of the day. Many of the neo-martyrs, especially among the hierarchs of our church, studied at these academies. It was due to his learning at the Athenite Academy that St. Cosmas the Aetolian was able to travel around Greece and preach the Orthodox faith to the people in the way that he did. This is also applied to many of the bishops who studied at these academies and went back to their dioceses and put what they had learned into practice. The work of the academies was simply one part of a much broader phenomenon of the monasteries, the clergy, and the hierarchs helping to preserve orthodoxy during Ottoman rule. The monasteries were home to many books and texts which were gathered, translated, and shared by monks, such as St. Nicodemus the Hagiarite, Makarios of Corinth, and Paisios of Velichovsky, which to this day continue to be read by the Orthodox faithful, including the Synaxarion, the Evergetinos, and the Philokalia. We know for a fact that neo-martyrs including St. Gerasimus of Carpenisi and St. George of Alikianos were inspired by the books that these saints had published. We also know that at this time, the clergy were continuing to educate the parishioners about the Orthodox faith, especially the children who attended the secret schools. This allowed orthodoxy to be handed down from one generation to the next. Last but not least, the hierarchs of the church, the bishops, metropolitans and patriarchs, served an important role in leading the Orthodox Church during these difficult times. They were answerable to the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire for the behavior of the Orthodox in the Empire and had many pressures and responsibilities. It is during times such as this, when the Church is challenged, that our hierarchs are called upon to shoulder the burden of their flock and act with utmost discernment. Perhaps no hierarch embodied this idea more than St. Gregory V of Constantinople. St. Gregory was born in 1746 to a poor family in Dimitsana and was originally named George. He was educated by a local monk and then attended the Evangeliki Scholi, the Orthodox Institute of Higher Learning in Smyrna. He also studied in Patmos at the school attached to the monastery of St. John the Theologian. It was during this time where George was tonsured and took on the name of Gregory. The Metropolitan of Smyrna at the time summoned St. Gregory and ordained him as a deacon in that metropolis. He eventually rose to the ecclesiastical ranks of Archdeacon and Protosingulus. After the previous Metropolitan reposed in 1785, St. Gregory was elected Metropolitan of Smyrna.
He was in this role for 12 years, until 1797, when he was elected Patriarch of Constantinople. St. Gregory became Patriarch during a difficult political period, in which tensions between the Church and the Ottoman Empire were not only high, but the Patriarchate itself was divided. However, in the face of political turmoil, St. Gregory still maintained his ascetic lifestyle, and in turn would not allow his decisions to be swayed by any agenda other than that which was best for his flock. As Patriarch, he did much to restore monastic discipline to the Patriarchate. He also restored many of the buildings and reinstituted a printing press. However, many of the hierarchs did not take to St. Gregory's reforms and pushed the Sultan to exile St. Gregory to Mount Athos. After his successor resigned in 1806, St. Gregory was elected Patriarch for a second time. This lasted until 1808, when he was exiled to the island of Brinkipur, and then afterwards went to Mount Athos. During his exiles on Mount Athos, he played a key role in the spiritual cultivation of two neomartyrs, Saint Septimius of the Mitzana and Saint Constantine, the former Muslim. He was elected Patriarch for a third and final time in 1819. It was during this time that a number of difficult decisions fell upon the shoulders of the Patriarch. When Alexander Ypsilantis crossed the Prut River in order to protect the Orthodox faithful from violent Ottoman retaliation, St. Gregory was forced to excommunicate Ypsilantis. While Ypsilantis understood the Patriarch had no choice, the difficulty of the decisions presented to St. Gregory are not to be understated. As the revolution broke out in 1821, Patriarch Gregory was strongly encouraged by many bishops to flee Constantinople, to which he replied, How could I abandon my flock? If I am Patriarch, it is to save my people not to give them over to the swords of the Janissaries. My death will be of more use than my life, because through it the Greeks will fight with the energy of despair which often produces victory. We are required to shepherd our flocks well, and to do that which is needed, as Jesus did for us, to save us. On Easter Day, April 10th, we are told by the Synaxarion the saint celebrated the liturgy of the resurrection calmly and with great solemnity, interrupted only by his tears. A few hours later, St. Gregory was seized by Ottoman forces and subject to interrogation and tortures. Just as Christ remained silent before his captors, so too did St. Gregory, only breaking his silence to declare, the patriarch of the Christians must die a Christian. Only three days before, the church relived the crucifixion in which Christ, the Good Shepherd, laid down his life for all of humanity. On Pascha Sunday, 1821, the humble shepherd of the Orthodox faithful, the Patriarch of Constantinople, Gregory, was hanged on the gates of the Patriarchate for his faith. Yet even the cruelty of his death bears the markings of God's providence. For it was on the day of the resurrection that St. Gregory received the crown of martyrdom and truly testified to the words of Christ, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. During his lifetime, St. Gregory was appointed to many positions of authority and power. However, it is important to note that he never sought out this lifestyle. St. Gregory was an ascetic at heart, a man who desired nothing more than to struggle for Christ. This was seen by his constant returns to Mount Athos during the periods in which he was not patriarch. His first priority was always to bring those around him towards Christ, be it the hierarchs in Constantinople or the repentant monks on Mount Athos. At the end of his life, he did it through his example during his martyrdom. As Patriarch, 
St. Gregory refrained from supporting many revolutions prior to 1821, discerning that the time was not yet right. He was constantly faced with impossible choices in which the safety of his flock was pitted against the desire for freedom from the Ottomans. Throughout it all, St. Gregory stood firm with Christ as his guide, seeking to do all in his power to protect the church and ensure the future of orthodoxy. The clergy, monks and hierarchs often paid the price for their actions in preserving the orthodox Christian faith. They were arrested, tortured and executed en masse, especially in the years after the Greek Revolution in 1821. And even in their final moments, they remained firm in their faith and continued to guide their flocks. Following the words of Christ in the Gospel according to St. John, they were good shepherds, laying down their lives for the faithful. We should always be grateful for the sacrifices that our hierarchs, clergy and monks, both neo-martyrs and those who witnessed in other ways, made to preserve the church and keep the faith alive. They struggled with all their hearts for the faith, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Without them, we may not be Orthodox Christian today. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of The Orthodox Journey. To keep up to date with our podcast, subscribe on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or head to orthodoxjourney.com where you can find even more Orthodox articles, talks, sermons and podcasts.